Yes, welcome to my talk, SIMD in high-level languages. Dear BobConf audience, um, I'm Matthias Wahl. Uh, the slides for this talk are reachable under um, the URL here and at the bottom left, so you, it, it stays there, so you can type it into your machine. And there's the repository where you see the slide sources and um, the code that I used uh, throughout the slides. So you can actually run it on your own and see what it gives you. About me, I'm a systems engineer at Wayfair. I work on the Tremor project, and I'm so privileged that I can do Rust for a living. That's actually uh, a fun thing. And um, doing working on Tremor, where we use SIMD heavily, uh, I was uh, made aware of, of this topic, and I want to share my experiences. Um, so, and I also want to thank uh, BobConf and the BobConf organizers because I got this job because of the last BobConf in 2020, um, which was a um, offline event, which was nice, given this current circumstances. So, uh, our agenda, my agenda is I will intro introduce you to the topic. I will tell you how what's in your chip and how to get access to SIMD how to do SIMD programming on a very um, uh, high level uh, point of view. And then uh, we will dive into some languages and how it's done there. For, um, um, it, it will be Julia, the JVM and Rust. Um, so let me introduce you to a poor little CPU. It's an AMD EPIC 7702ES. And um, this is a die shot uh, you see here. And it's a sad CPU because it is treated mean, it's misused. Um, it has so much to offer. It's so capable, but it's only assigned borrowing task. Um, mostly uh, general purpose registers, borrowing calculations, um, JavaScript execution, I, you, you name it. Like um, it's, it's, it's a sad uh, CPU because it has so much more to offer. It has such nice capabilities. It even has a physical part that is so capable, but nobody is talking about it. Let's zoom further in. And here you see on the left side, you see a physical area which is currently and mostly used for floating point operations. So it's this blue area here um, with the two banks on, um, on the top and, and below. And looking at those, so um, those are used for floating point operations like um, any you can imagine. But actually, this is able to do uh, the same floating point operations on up to eight floating uh, floats or, or um, at the same time, at the same speed, with the same latency and the same throughput. But it's only used for one. And that's sad. It could be like the CPU could be eight times more efficient, but most of the time it actually isn't. Um, and let me show you what the CPU is capable of, and let's make sure that we make the most of our CPU and make it happy and have a happy little CPU in our machines and in our servers, and um, so we can also be happy. So what does this um, SIMD unit, this super capable magic, uh, magic area offer for us? So it offers SIMD operations. What does SIMD stand for? It's single input multiple data. So it's so you have a single instruction that is operating on multiple data items. So it's operating on those in parallel. So at the same speed as I just uh, explained. A similar form of data parallelism is GPU programming, where you do the same but have uh, a lot bigger um, uh, factor of parallelism. So those SIMD units they give us huge registers. They are called vectors. They are up to 512 bits wide, although 128 is the common denominator across platforms. And those huge vectors, they are interpreted as packed numeric types. So as much as fits in there, for example, in the 128-bit vectors I um, painted above, uh, you see there are two lanes, two numeric types fit uh, of 64 bits fit in there, say two doubles, right? And um, those uh, slices of this huge vector, um, according to 
how it's interpreted are called lanes. So they are, it, it, depending on the lane size you choose, you have a different number of lanes. Uh, that's, um, I think, obvious from the drawing. And then what we get is a huge set of assembly instructions. And these can be categorized as lane-wise operations. For example, at um, each lane in two registers. So we have the VP at W um, instruction that adds um, the, 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 um, the values in each lane and puts it into the result vector at the same lane. Then we have horizontal operations, a bit more special, where, for example, in the example I draw here, where we add adjacent uh, lanes and put them at a certain place in the resulting vector. And we can do this on two, um, two vectors because we need to fill the result vector. And then we have masked operations, which are very powerful. There we do a certain operation only if the mask at this lane, so it's also a, a, a vector, um, if the mask at this lane has the value one. Otherwise, we don't do it or we do something different. So how do we actually get access um, to those instructions and to this unit? Um, it's via instruction set extensions. So, and they may not be available on your CPU. So I have another machine here, which um, is not capable of doing more than 128 bits. So it doesn't have bigger registers, right? Um, for example, Intel um, has such extensions around since 1997. That's more than 20 years now. So this concept is around and there are there's support for this since more than 20 years. And there is a, a jungle of different extensions. And uh, when speaking about the x86 extensions, you can, uh, you can say that they are backward compatible. So when you have, say, AVX2, you also have AVX. And usually you also have SSE4 or SSE3. So um, it's additive in most cases. So in ARM, you have Neon, which is the most uh, known one, well-known and well-supported one. It's there around, it's around ARMv7. In RISC-V, you have the extension V, uh, which handles um, um, vector extensions and SIMD. And then in PowerPC, for example, you have Altivec. So let's look at uh, such instructions. This is an Intel, um, an Intel instruction. Um, and let's look, it's CVT TPD 2DQ, and it's a horrible name. Uh, it, it, it would be a good name for a robot or something, but it's a name for an instruction. So you tell the robot, it's, it's a um, instruction for a robot. So um, let's look what, what this all means. It means uh, CVT stands for convert with truncation. So you round towards zero while you convert a packed double precision floating point number to a double quadrat 64 bit. So all those, all those uh, letters do make sense. Um, they're just very cryptic. And it's, um, I think it might be because it's written by wizards that know those spells. Yes, and there are more magic spells you can use to, uh, um, to access the SIMD unit and to instruct it what to do. But those I leave as an exercise for the reader. There's actually good documentation by Intel and ARM, for example, on what this means. So if we don't want to write ugly assembler and use magic spells that only the elders um, of uh, the internet know, then we can use, we actually do use something already. Um, that's, and this concept is called auto vectorization. And it's a bit co called a vectorization because it turns our borrowing normal code, like where we think in more human terms or what, what we usually have on every CPU, and we turn this into something that is that can make use of those vectors of those SIMD units. So that's vectorization, um, and auto, it's called auto vectorization because our compiler does it for us. So we don't even need to bother with this; it, it's done for us because our compilers know our CPU better than we do. Given a little uh, example C function here, it's um, creating a running sum from the array and uh, summing up all the elements in it. So we loop over the array 
and access every element. And our compiler is clever enough to see that it could um, operate on multiple array items at once and um, create a running sum in a, uh, in a different way. And it does. Um, so when I, I was writing a small benchmark with a length, array length of 1,000, and I enabled zero optimization. So the compiler took the code and translated it one-to-one -to, -one to a machine instruction. As I wrote it, um, it took me by my word. And um, I do it with the flag minus 0 on my C compiler. And the resulting um, um, time is one iteration took 60, 630 ticks. If I enable auto vectorization, it now, it's now down to uh, 153 ticks. So it's up to four times faster. So how come um, it's so fast? Because it's auto vectorizing and it's using um, uh, vector instructions like VP at D here. It's, um, it's using the SIMD register. So it, it, it's adding actually eight ints at, at a time in those YMM registers that support 256 um, bits. And so eight ints fit in there. Nice. So we actually can use it, and our compiler does it for us. It's Our compiler is actually so good, I tried to find an example of a simple algorithm where auto-vectorization doesn't work, and I couldn't find one. So um, it's super powerful, and our compilers are actually really good. Um, big shout out to those who write those compilers. Um, there's another way if auto-vectorization uh, doesn't help, or if it's not good enough, or um, if we write something more complex, or if we just want to have fun doing the raw thing, we can use C intrinsics. These are small wrapper functions and types provided by um, those vendors that um, give us um, those extensions. And um, you, they are available on the platform and they come with your compiler. So here, for example, I, I have a small example you need to include the imintrin.h header on x86. It will give you your intrinsics. And here are some for loading floats into SSE registers, into an SSE register of 128 bits. So this needs the SSE 4.2, I think, um, to work. And then here I do a horizontal add three times of, this, of all those vectors to finally get out the first one in a very cryptic and horrible way. But I, but this basically is the algorithm for summing up all those, uh, all those floats I put in there before. So yes, so they are offered by every platform. So we have them. If you have a C compiler, you have them. And you have the headers, you get full control. So all these functions, they often, most of the time, they map to exactly one instruction. So you have in the documentation of those vendors, you have, um, they also specify what instruction it is, what the operation is doing, and what's the latency and throughput. So you can get this. Um, you have full control, nice. It's very low level, as I said, um, but they are sometimes, they're super complicated. They are horribly named. And like the algorithms you write, you write them for one platform. If you want to have something portable, you need to re-implement it for every other platform, or even for every x86 CPU um, that uh, has like for every different extension, right? And there are a lot, lots of extensions. Okay, so these are the very low-level ways to access uh, to get access to our CPU's uh, SIMD unit. How how does it look like programming SIMD? Um, because if you do it a certain number of times, there are patterns emerging, and I want to tell you about uh, some of them. So usually, what you do is you split your data into chunks according to your SIMD register size. So you want to chunk it up so it fits into a SIMD register so you can operate on it. Then you, uh, So you load those chunks from memory into your SIMD register. You do the magic on those uh, lanes, on those registers. And then you store the memory, you store back to memory, or you extract the result in some way. So you get, uh, so you leave the uh, rearm of those SIMD registers again. 
And then because um, your data might not be aligned to your SIMD register size, and it might be, might be a little bit more uh, at the end, you always need to handle the Scala, the, the tail. I call it the Scala tail because you need to, you cannot use the SIMD register here most of the time. So you need to basically re-implement the algorithm or do the magic in a Scala way. So in the normal way using, um, using those registers, um, uh, those general purpose registers. So I, I, let's, let's look at this in an example. So uh, find first the first byte in an array, which is also known as memchar from the C standard library. So we get, um, so this is a, a small function, a C function, I, I chose x86 AVX2, and we get a haystack array and a needle we search for and the length of this array because it's C. And <clears throat> we first check the length and see if it's, if we can actually use uh, our SIMD uh, registers, our vectors. And if we can, we iterate over the whole Array, so we have the IDX variable, and we iterate over the array in chunk sizes, so in vector size chunks, and then we access the haystack at that point and do our magic. And here we have the Scala tail, which um, in which we run if there's something, if there's a tail left, and we do a Scala fallback. So this is an example SIMD loop here where we at line three, where we load the data from the haystack at the current index, and then we compare for uh, the needle vector. And so we compare, if, like we check if any lane in this chunk, which is extracted from the array loaded from memory is equal to the needle. And if so, um, we extract a, a mask, uh, a, a bit mask from the register and check if, if it's uh, non-zero and then we get um, the first non-zero value to return the proper index. And if we didn't return, we're going to iterate uh, one more time. And here's the Scala loop, which just implements it all in a very simple way. We iterate, and then we check for each index. And if it's true, if it is equal, then we return. So um, I do, like given all of this, um, so given all this, SIMD patterns, how you would program, how you have access, all the tools. Um, here's my wish list for high-level SIMD. So what, how would I want to program um, my SIMD algorithms uh, with the high-level languages? So what do I want to um, abstract? So I want to abstract the SIMD register. I want to have a type or some other abstraction of how to work with, SIM, with, with those registers. I want to abstract over different architectures and extensions. So um, each extension has a differently sized register. So I, we need to abstract over this. And we need to have fallbacks for other architectures because not all instructions, for example, all masked instructions are available on each um, machine. It would be nice if it would auto detect available features on my host CPU. So it, knows what's available and can choose the most efficient uh, uh, algorithms and most efficient instruction set. And I want to have intuitive interaction with the language type system. So in Java, it should be somehow classes. So it should not be, I don't want to write inline assembler. So, and it should generate efficient instructions. So this is my, my wish list. But I understand the other side too. Like I'm, as a user, I have a certain requirements, but as a language designer, I also, uh, you also want some, some properties uh, of this, and, and there are some challenges um, uh, emerging here. So usually the vector or the array are go to data structures for consecutive values, uh, right? But those SIMD registers, they are also a form of uh, consecutive values of a fixed size. So, but we already have good types for this. Um, so how do we map the relation? So how do we relate those? Another thing is, in most languages, variables are, are pointers to the heap, or like uh, they exactly uh, are values on the stack, reference values on the stack. But SIMD, um, in SIMD, we have those registers, 
right? So we want to um, we want to have uh, something that describes a register, but it's also we also want to capture it as a variable. So it, it's a different thing, kind of um, than what we usually have. And because and those SIMD registers, those uh, fixed size consecutive uh, container of consecutive values. It only exists in the CPU and is otherwise not a thing. So I only have those um, SIMD containers for the values the CPU supports. And um, when I structure my code in, in a way, um, then I usually do it to represent something in the more or less something in the real world. So a list of prices or, or something. But um, when I need to structure something according to SIMD, uh, it, it, I structure it because my CPU is capable of it, so there's no external representation I, I map here. And we also need to find a good one-time representation because we have this uh, thing we have on this on, on the SIMD register that is that supports all those SIMD operations, but maybe we want to have those structures in a list or in a map, or we want to do something with it uh, in a different way. So we need to have it also supported outside of those registers. Um, and that's interesting. That's an interesting challenge, I think. So let's go to our first language and see uh, how um, SIMD works here. So it's Julia. I chose it as an example of an array programming language or a programming language with which you can do array programming, more or less. Um, and it's basically Array programming is um, programming with multidimensional arrays or one-dimensional, multidimensional uh, arrays, matrices, everything in a convenient and straightforward fashion. So these are first level uh, objects and things you, you program with. And it's easy to express, for example, broadcasting a function onto every element. And yeah, so it's, it's convenient to do this. And it's convenient in Julia to do this. Here, for example, I broadcasted the addition with one on the given literal array, but it could be any array of any shape and Julia would know what to do here. The good thing is here, I just described intent. So I want to have uh, one added to each element, but how it's done, I don't care. I don't describe how it's done exactly. I just describe um, the operation. So. The, and the compiler can freely vectorize. It can choose the most efficient implementation, and it does. So in Julia, you can spit out um, the uh, assembly for the operation you, um, or for the function call you just do. And, and you see here, it, has, it uses 256 AVX2 uh, registers, and it loads the stuff in uh, always for because it was unrolling the loop and then it adds and then it moves it back. So it's it, it shows for this very simple instruction, it, it shows a very efficient implementation. And that's also like one uh, example for good auto vectorization. And in like I didn't even need to know about uh, SIMD, right? But it, it it's already good. If I want to go and do explicit SIMD, I need to define a fixed size tuple of elements that, like, that are vec element of, in this case, I chose float64, but all the supported primitive numeric types. And, like, uh, um, and this end tuple here uh, represents, um, so it shows uh, the number of lanes and the type for each lane, and the size is implicit. So this one spans to 556 uh, bits. So this describes a 256-bit register. And those are, and this representation and all of the operations, they implement it on top of the LLVM vector type. So LLVM describes an intermediate representation. So it's kind of a platform independent assembly and it supports a vector type. So it, it, it's able to, um, it supports an platform independent uh, abstraction for the SIMD register. 
So this is how I would instantiate such a register with constant values. And the compiler would transform this into an LLVM vector. And if I want to do any operations on this, I would need to use inline LLVM IR. So this is as like, it's kind of readable, but it's also ugly and you need to understand LLVM IR and you need to understand like syntax and the semantics. And it's um, not a good, it's not a convenient and usable and ergonomic interface, but it provides us with all the low level bits we need to get some more convenience. And this is what um, was done with the CMD Julia package, CMD JL. It's really good. And I uh, implemented our file first, our memchar example um, in Julia with this package. So you, you need to import it by stating using SIMD. And then in our SIMD loop, we do load it from a vector from our um, array um, in the variable haystack. We load it into the register reg, and then we compare it against the needle. And it will automatically vectorize, uh, like do the comparison against another vector. So we have a vector comparison. And then we need to check in the result if any value is true. And if so, we loop over all the indexes and check at each lane. And if it's non-zero, we return the index plus, uh, plus the actual offset of the first uh, bind, we found, bind we found. So we. We basically, we, we chose a simple comparison operation. We can index it. So it's really uh, idiomatic Julia code we write here. And it's seven times faster than unoptimized an unoptimized Scala loop in Julia, seven times. But still, it's four times slower than the C standard lib memchar. So there's still wiggle room left to the top. But I made an um, improvement of um, times seven, which is really nice. And it was not so hard to write. So Julia offers array programming, which is in general nice for vectorization. So like array programming languages and array programming programs um, often make good use of the SIMD unit. And Julia provides a very raw SIMD interface in the standard lib, but uh, you can write ergonomic SIMD code with SIMD JL. It has good interactions with arrays. You can load, store consecutive values, but also gather and scatter from uh, all over the place. <clears throat> and we found that the LLVM vector type is not as powerful as native intrinsics, but they give you a good um, and stable interface that works cross-platform, and that is nice. So let's come to our next contestant. It's SIMD on the JVM. Wow. Um, there is a Java enhancement proposal number 338, and it's called the Vector API. It's going to add SIMD, explicit SIMD support, and it's going to land in JDK 16 as an incubating module. Early access builds are already available. And what does it include? So it includes the vector thing. It's a typed interface to SIMD registers. It's parameterized on the lane type, so you have a byte vector where you handle bytes, you have a short vector, an int, a long vector, a float, and double. And it's parameterized on the register size. So you say, I want a byte double, a byte vector of 256 bits because this is what my uh, platform supports. Here, for example, I rebroadcast the uh, 0xff byte to, or to a 256 uh, vector. And then we have a vector that is. Uh, parameterized on the lane type and the size. So you don't even need, need to know which size it is. You can pass it on to functions and they don't need to know. So they can check the length, they can check the number of lanes and it's pretty, it gets pretty uh, independent of those particularities. So the vector size is usually a property of the host CPU and what it supports. And this is auto detected for you at one time by the JVM, which is nice and you can choose the preferred, the maximum available uh, vector size, but you don't need to know the exact vector size. So you can write portable code. And then we write our instructions. So those vectors uh, offer all the like comparison, arithmetic, uh, bit logic instructions. And 
when the when finally if you have a hot loop at some at some place sometime the JIT will kick in the hotspot C2 JIT and it will emit SIMD instructions for those functions for those comparison functions because um, so they are implemented in plain Java but they will be replaced by the hotspot JIT with SIMD instructions and so you have the fallback so it actually supports all those operations in its interface and if your platform supports it, those operations um, will emit uh, very efficient instructions. So I was writing the memchar, the find first byte example in Java, and here you see in the line two that I chose the preferred vector, they call it species, vector species, which is basically the size. I chose the preferred one because I want to use the most efficient one given the platform this program runs on. Then I have my memchar function here, where I broadcast the needle onto a vector, and I check in the species how often I can loop uh, on the haystack uh, array. So uh, how often I can iterate, given um, I want to fit, I want to iterate in chunks of this size of the species. Then I load my byte vector from an array hay haystack at the index idx, and I compare it against my needle vector for equality. And then I get a mask back and I check um, is, I check for the first element that is true. And if there's none, um, if there's one, then I return the index plus the index of the first two, which is the index of the first uh, needle byte in this array. So that is cool. So I have a nice interface to write my Scala code, but still um, it's hard to beat this very, very simple and straightforward Java code, uh, which is auto-vectorized automatically by the JVM, because the JVM is also able to auto-vectorize my simple code. And I was running a small benchmark on my machine, uh, given um, the Scala version for which you see the uh, which is the blue uh, line and my SMD version which is the orange line. So I, I went a benchmark with where I put the, in, the byte to find the different indexes in my very long array. So from uh, one to uh, 10,000. And then I measured the operations per second it was able to do. So the find memchar operations per second it was able to do in my benchmark. And you see for very, very low numbers, like up to 100, 500, um, the Scala version, the auto vectorized version by the JVM was up to 10 times faster. So it's um, rapidly declining, but it's very, very fast and very, very, like up to 10 times faster than my optimized SMD version. But then at a, an index of 1,000, like doing 1,000 comparison operations in the Scala version, my uh, SMD implementation actually became, and with a constant factor, um, four times faster than constantly uh, across, across the board, four times faster than the actual, um, the actual auto vector by Scala code. So it, yeah, it was hard to beat, beat it. So judgment day, Java. It has a thoughtful and rich API. It, it, you can do really portable SMD programming, which is nice. And I predict it's going to be immensely powerful, uh, immensely powerful addition to the JVM ecosystem. But it provides, it gives you a little bit of unpredictable performance because you don't exactly know when the um, when the um, hotspot shit kicks in, and you don't know exactly which instruction is run. So, yes. Let's do something, let's let's talk about Rust and let's talk about passing JSON in Rust with SIMD, which is fun. But first, what does Rust provide? So the Rust core, um, which is also usable on bare metal, um, provides the Arch, um, create core Arch, and it gives access to our vendor specific intrinsics, like it exposes the C intrinsics for you in Rust. It also, like you have the raw power you have with C intrinsics, nice. It gives you one-time checks for supported features, so you can basically auto-detect what features are available. 
that is nice. And then you can choose at runtime the most efficient um, the most efficient version of your algorithm. So it's possible to compile portable binaries with optimization optimizations for different target features. So with portable, I mean a portable across all instances of a certain architecture. So SIMD JSON, this is the project we use at Tremor. We use heavily at Tremor and um, uh, we are quite proud of. So it's a part of the Maya C++ SIMD JSON project, which is, I think, the fastest SIMD JSON parser in the world right now. And yeah, so, so what does it do? So how, why SIMD for JSON parsing? And what, um, so it's focused on maxing out the performance and therefore I didn't choose a nice high level um, uh, language feature for um, doing the SIMD, but it shows the vendor intrinsics to get and access the raw power at the cost of re-implementing the algorithms for each platform. Because the reason for this is because different stuff works for different platforms. So it's different if you have 128 bits available or when you have 512 bits available. So it's um, because of the uh, level of parallelism, you can do other stuff and other stuff is faster than what you would do with the 128 bits, for example. And it shows a completely different algorithm with what um, compared to what you would expect from a normal uh, JSON parsing algorithm. So the what I call Scala approach would be to iterate the given byte stream, the given string or byte stream, and build up a JSON data structure while checking each byte and checking if it's a control character, is it this quickly, is it a, is it, um, a quote or something, and build up the JSON hash map or the JSON array or build up the class. So um, SIMD JSON actually does multiple passes over the byte stream. At pass one, it, it's, it, it's detecting structural characters, like squiggly, colon, quote, comma, and white space, and builds up a, an index map of those, um, a bitmap of indices of those characters. And then the second pass, it iterates over those structurals and builds a tape of tokens uh, so it, so if you have an open squiggly, then you know an object is beginning. So you can put a object token and start parsing the object. And then it builds, and, and from this tape of tokens, so you basically have an array of tokens, you can, you will, you're going to build structs or a map or an array or whatever you use the SIMD JSON parser for. This is uh, the ARM Neon version. I, I quickly scroll through it because it's very hard to read. And this, uh, the, the ARM Neon version of the character detection algorithm we use. And um, I'm going to explain this quickly to you. So, um, uh, for example, the closing quickly here uh, is represented as the byte 0x7d. And if you split it up into two nibbles, that is two four byte values, you get the seven and the 13. And then we use the 7 and the 13 to look up indices into different tables. And, and what we get out is a certain number for each of them. And when we end together this number, we get a certain, we get the value for a certain character class uh, determined by this lookup table. And we need to end it with a certain mask so it doesn't overflow a certain value for us. And then we get a character class indicator, which is the one, for example, here, because the squigglies, they fall into the class number one. We need to split out, split this out into nibbles because um, the tables are just 16 elements wide and um, on, on ARM because ARM has just 128 bits. And <clears throat> so we need to split it up and then end it together again to get the character class. So this seems to be a bit um, a bit of a weird algorithm to classify a character. We could just basically do an OR comparison for the byte. But this algorithm, every step um, works on 16 values 
at a time. So what we actually end up with is we have around 11 or 12 instructions for creating a support for explicit SIMD programming give, comes, becomes more and more widespread. There are SIMD, SIMD high-level SIMD libraries for C, C++, coming up in the next standard. In Java, as I showed you, in Rust, there are, uh, there are efforts to have portable SIMD. There's something in Julia, there's something in Swig, and Swift, everything based on LLVM supports it, basically. And you can do actually portable SIMD programming, which is ergonomic. And it has a lot of promising potential, so you could make your CPU happy, right? But it's no silver bullet, as i shown you with my, uh, with my Java example. So wrapping up, performance optimization is, is a hard topic. It, it, it's an art, basically. So it requires extensive testing and benchmarking and more than often, your initial hunch is incorrect. So, and you also see that simple porting of Scalar algorithms doesn't always work. Um, so SIMD JSON took a different algorithm. My Java find first byte was very, uh, sh not so very well performing, but it's fun. It, it's really fun. It's like a, um, discovering a new kind of like set of tools for your CPU and play with it. It's beneficial because um, your code might run faster, be more efficient, and be done sooner. Nice. And you can actually show off, right? Because they